this is an example, I think, of what the Jets are in for over the next several months and what could be into the season. We'll see whatever uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. announces his running mate next week. Uh, but reports like this that are not really backed up, Pamela Brown and Jake Tapper on CNN uh, with the news, this was last week, I believe exactly a week ago today, whenever um, it was announced that Rodgers was near the top or at the top of the choices for Kennedy to uh, announce as a running mate. Um, Pamela Brown specifically had a, a reports that she had a, a firsthand account back in 2013 at the Kentucky Derby is where they ran into each other, her and Rodgers, where the report from CNN, um, they... Rogers shared false Sandy Hook conspiracy theories in private conversations. Now, Rogers took to social media and says that it, absolutely not. He doesn't buy into the Alex Brown conspiracy theories that Alex Brown was ordered to pay $1.5 billion that forced him to file bankruptcy. Alex Jones. Uh, Alex Jones, excuse yeah. me. Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking about Pamela Brown. Alex Jones, um, $1.5 billion dollars to the Sandy Hook families uh, through a couple of different um, lawsuits that went in front of judges. Um, and, of course, Rogers is denying this. And Pamela Brown is even saying that, you know, he in these conversations, he's discussing, like, men in, dressed in black as government operatives in the woods. I mean, it goes into detail. And as you would expect... We're asking questions, as one would. Okay, well, where's the proof? And not just us. Here's Stephen A. Smith. Now, for me, in the interest of fairness, I would ask this of the CNN reporter and CNN as a network. Why are we hearing about this just now, if this is what transpired in 2013? How is that happening? If you're in the news business, how is something relevant 12 years later? when you never mentioned it 12 years ago. I understand that Aaron Rodgers may be a VP running mate of RFK Jr., but he isn't yet. And if he isn't yet, then what would be the reason for bringing this up now? And if you're going to bring this up now, where's the evidence? Because I got news for you. After Aaron Rodgers <laughs> issued his statement, the burden is on Ms. Pamela Brown. The burden is on CNN. Where's your evidence? You reported allegations of Aaron Rodgers being associated with a conspiracy theory that denies the killings, the murders of elementary school kids in Sandy Hook Elementary School. Where's your evidence? That's where the onus lies now. And this is uh, now CNN with Jake Tapper as well, who had the tweet uh, that he posted, breaking from me and Pamela Brown, CNN, RFK Jr.'s VP prospect, Aaron Rodgers, has shared false Sandy Hook conspiracy theories in private conversations. Then they link the story to CNN. And you can go back uh, further where they're saying, well, Rodgers didn't deny these claims um, and, and the comments made to Brown, but did say on X, and this is a quote from Rodgers, as I'm on the record saying in the past, what happened in Sandy Hook is an absolute tragedy. I am not and never have been of the opinion that the events did not take place. Again, I hope that we learn from this and other tragedies to identify the signs that will allow us to prevent unnecessary loss of life. My thoughts and prayers continue to remain with the families affected, along with the entire Sandy Hook community. That from Rogers. This, this is exactly what we were discussing uh, as an example of the confusion, the distraction, and the craziness that will be around Rogers within the Jets organization and continues to be. But well, first and foremost, um, yes. I mean, it, it, private conversations and not naming the second person that they're saying is also backing this up and making other allegations against Rodgers, you got to have more than this, than just some, hey, this is, this is what I was told whenever I was hanging out with him. And it's a broader media issue in a lot of ways that, that we're dealing with right now. And this is not exclusive to any one network also. Yeah, but right. CNN is guilty of this this way. I love the show The X-Files when I was a kid. But Mulder and Scully, the whole thing. On the show The X-Files, they had the tagline, 
of I want to believe. And there was a poster that Mulder had in his office, Fox Mulder, played by David Duchovny, terrific character, had a poster of a UFO, and underneath it it said, I want to believe. This is the problem with media right now. They don't believe, they want to believe. So if you are someone who hates Aaron Rodgers and believes that he supports Donald Trump or he's anti-vax or whatever it is that you stand against, you want to believe that he also is a Sandy Hook denier. And that he is someone who is evil in many ways. You want to believe these stories. So what does media do? Oh, they they spoon feed it to you. You want to believe it? Here you go. I heard one time at the Kentucky Derby in a private conversation that he believes in these things. Here you go. I don't have to have proof. I can just say a private conversation happened and he shared this in private conversation. What even is the burden of proof anymore on media to share something like that? We're talking about private conversations now, not something recorded, not something on the record, not something someone posted on social media, as Aaron Rodgers pointed to, that he he actually posted the opposite of whatever he allegedly said in private conversation. I think all of it's wrong, and I think it all stems from the want to believe. People that don't like someone else because of an opposite political view or an opposite stance on a certain issue, they want to believe. They want badly to believe. And you know what media companies are happy to do? Serve up belief to them. And that's what CNN is guilty of here. They they don't need proof. Stephen A. Smith is right, by the way, in everything he said. The burden of proof is on them. They don't care. Doesn't matter. I could say anything right now about, you know, I've heard in private conversation, this person has said this and that. What does that even mean? Why would anyone believe that? Why would you choose to believe that? Because you want to believe If you want to believe something bad about someone, you will believe anything bad you hear about that person. And CNN is guilty of feeding into this. Well, and this is uh, Pamela Brown saying that this is a conversation between her and Rogers, not that she was just told something. And she's going into uh, detail about Brown recalls Rogers asking her if she thought it was off that there were men in black in the woods by the school falsely claiming that those men were actually government operatives and that Brown found the encounter disturbing. You know, in, in going into uh, you know, crisis actors instead of actual victims um, and, and parents and all that, and just nuts. Uh, and, and now that you, you've got Robert Kennedy Jr. having a, a, to, uh, to answer for it too, um, with releasing statements. You know, it's just, you're right. I mean, this is- But just private it, it, conversation, it, like if I were to report things that I've heard in private conversation, I'm, I'm gonna give you an example. Not, not heard, but told. Uh, maybe they talked about this, right? She says that whenever he found out that she was in the media, that's whenever he came over and t- started saying things like, why don't you report other, other, why don't you report the actual news? And that they struck up this conversation. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, again, did Aaron Rodgers, you know, did he uh, read something or see something on some conspiracy s- site about it and ask questions about it? I, I don't know, but... The burden of proof of going on television now or saying something. You know, I heard this person say this in a private conversation. Whether I had it with them or not is so low that, and this again goes back to what do people believe versus what is true. This is what I know about this story. If you love vaccines and you love the response to COVID and everything else and all of that, right? You love this story. Aaron Rodgers is a quack. Aaron Rodgers is someone who believes in other conspiracy theories. He's anti-science. He's anti-vax, all of this. I don't believe that about Aaron Rodgers. But if you believe that, that's how you're going to read into this story. And then everyone else is just immediately going to say, oh, there's no way. Aaron Rodgers would have said that. He's already said he hasn't. There's no way that happens. So we go right back to the do you want to believe or not? What side do you want to believe? Not actually reporting fact or truth. Yeah, just wanting the, the, the attention. Wanting to win the, the ratings battle. And, and also, Chad, like... Or what, wanting to just pander why, to your audience. Well, because you want to keep the audience. And you, now you have the other side of the audience, too. Why, why not uh, say... This, this, this account was from 2013 at the Kentucky Derby. And you would think that you... I mean, there are plenty of other opportunities to bring this story up. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you're just playing into Rogers in the headlines... You know, you mentioned anti-vax. You mentioned uh, it, the, the whole Kimmel this, the spat. 
you know, there's plenty of different areas and branches on the tree to go and uh, go after Aaron Rodgers. The, the timing of this is also just well, and why they bring it up now is they, they don't. You, you they Tapper don't, saying breaking news. Yeah, they don't. They don't want Aaron Rodgers to affect the candidate they want to win. That's well, why the timing is now. He might actually be a, in the race. But but now they have the candidate that they want to win. They have connected him to someone through their reporting that they say has this belief. You know. Like it just. It, oh, they don't want. Are you saying Joe Biden believes this? No, I'm saying like that if if they're going after if they're going after RFK Jr. Oh, they are. But they're but they're doing that through uh, his VP possible possibil- v- VP possible running VP, mate, yeah. but not not the current well, let's, VP nominee running mate. Like that. You well, see what I'm saying? But also in doing this, why not? They are disavowing Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for even considering him. That's the goal here. This well, guy is considering he's down to Jesse the Body Ventura and Aaron Rodgers. Let me tell you about a private conversation I had in 2013 with Aaron Rodgers that will show you how much of a quack he is and how much of a quack Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is for daring to question vaccines or daring to question the COVID vaccine at all. That's what they're trying to do here. It's, it's implementing doubt to anyone else that's showing, oh, these are just a extreme wing loony bin people that well, you don't need to vote for. Why? Because they want their candidate ultimately to win. And for whatever reason, people believe that Robert, is, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to steal from their candidate. Well, this, this is a, a step further than that, though. You know, co- connecting the Sandy Hook tragedy and, and a conversation from 2013. But it's it, all in an effort to disavow Aaron Rodgers and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. That's what they're doing. Well, That's the goal. Well, and then, I mean... You, you have, but but my point I is like there's the, there's plenty of public statements made by Aaron Rodgers that you can just go and see his public record, sure, and you can agree or disagree with him. And there are a bunch of people who think he's a loon right now, yeah, deranged, right? And a bunch of those people probably voted for Biden, right? And they think he's an idiot and he's deranged. So now we're just making things up that hey, if you liked Aaron, if you like Aaron Rodgers' vaccine take, let me tell you about his Sandy Hook take. This is the next effort to just disavow him as a candidate and disavow Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's a playbook that's tried and true. Well, I mean, I, I'm seeing it very clearly right now about what the attempt is. Well, but the playbook is also, um, is also oh, let's back it up with an unnamed source that doesn't want the public scrutiny and the attention. That's why they're staying an- anonymous on the condition of anonymity, right? They add the second version that doesn't have any name behind it. You know, we, we have Pamela Brown's name, but the second version that Tapper's pointing to, there is no, no. there's no one backing it up. And that also, uh, it's now on CNN to, you know, actually put forward some evidence here. The burden yeah. of proof. Chad, the burden of proof through the federal investigation for the sports gambling through illegal wagering and uh, illegal uh, a bookmaker in California. His name, uh, Matthew Boyer of Orange County. It has led to, and they were, they were investigating him and raided his home last year. They, it has led to Otani's interpreter being fired from the Dodgers for allegations that he's connected to this. Um, upwards of $4.5 million dollars that Otani and his lawyers say was, th- was stolen from Otani. And the story has developed from about 24 hours ago through the LA Times with further detail, where Major League Baseball says, and I think this is very important the way they worded this Otani is not currently facing discipline. And Major League Baseball did not know of this connection ahead of time until it was reported until the uh the interpreter was fired what if you believe that or not well, we can certainly discuss but boyer apparently has had no contact with otani just through the connection of the interpreter there's another inve- M- mizuhara is the interpreter. There's yeah. another investigation. There was another federal investigation that had ties. It doesn't necessarily connect to this, but I guess it could, with Yasiel Puig, who was also named in a separate investigation. But the interpreter 
in two different accounts is saying two different things. He says that it was upwards of four and a half million dollars in debt, that Otani covered his gambling debt, but said that Otani had zero involvement with any of the sports betting that the interpreter was, was actually involved in. Then he changed his story. He said that he still didn't have any involvement, but that he, he didn't necessarily cover the gambling debt either, which Otani's side is saying, we didn't do anything. This, is, this was pure theft, the millions. The guy says he never bet on baseball. We've heard that before. It was only soccer, NFL, college football, and NBA. And the policy with Major League Baseball is you cannot bet on diamond sports, meaning baseball, softball, but you can bet in, 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 in legal states on other sports. That's basically what the NFL is doing now. But Otani didn't speak to reporters. The Dodgers are playing over in Korea, which I, be, I believe these games count. Yeah, yeah, the first two games of their season. Okay, the Dodgers are playing over in Korea. They're one and one after today. Uh, Dodgers PR, they were staked out in front of the locker. They, he's a new interpreter now through the team. And this is the, this is the face of baseball. He is Major League Baseball. He's the Babe Ruth of our era. And... Like it or not, he's connected to a guy who was betting through a bookmaker because you can't do it legally in California on an app. Chad, this is going to be just the surface level of where this story takes us because there will be digging here. There's a federal investigation going on. Uh, the bookmaker, the, the bookie's home was raided a year ago. And you have the guy that's been connected at the hip to Otani with four and a half million dollars owed to this guy. They've connected it back. No, Otani, as of this point, has no involvement, and thankfully has no involvement in this. But the way that we view betting on baseball compared to the other sports, where if Calvin Ridley bets on his team at the time, it was the Atlanta Falcons, he's handed a one-year suspension. It was indefinite, but it's a one-year suspension. He could reply for, uh, apply for reinstatement a year later, and he did. He was reinstated. And baseball is different because everyone thinks of Pete Rose. And while if you bet on any other sport in an illegal uh, situation like this, if a player did this and it was on basketball, you could face a, a one-year suspension. If you bet on baseball, we know what happens. And it is the banned punishment, like Pete Rose. I am fascinated by this because while the NFL, through the last two years, has been rolling through these, oh, this guy's suspended for six games because he was betting on team property. This guy is suspended for a year because he bet on the NFL um, and bet on football. It's different because we don't hear about NBA players betting. We don't hear about Major League Baseball having these sports betting companies dig up and, and go back to who's betting when, where, what, and how. And we don't see it in the NHL for the most part. Apparently, these guys just don't do it. But it's all about the perception, right? The NFL is trying to just have the perception of, we've been against Vegas, now we're in Vegas, and we want you to know that we're going to do everything possible to make sure the integrity of the sport is protected. And it is a wide open field in baseball. We, it's got to be. And they don't want to have that perception because, well, they can't ban for life 30 players. They don't want to do that. But in this case, Otani, if for any reason, he's connected back to baseball, sports, and gambling. This is a hell of a story that could just be getting started because they can't just say you're suspended for a year because Pete Rose is back in. Pete Rose is, he's, he's, he, he's got what, exactly what yeah. we all agree she should have. And we don't know that he's bet anything yet. No, I said that, that he has no involvement, yeah. but, but I think it is key, uh, the, the, the quote from Major League, not currently facing discipline. 
they, they phrased that well because they're still waiting on more information. It's, it's an amazing intersection of Japanese culture with American reputation in this story. And here's what I mean by this. If this story was simply, and I've read through the timeline. By the way, Mike Gunzelman Gun Show has a great thread on X right now detailing kind of his thoughts on this. But I know Outkick's got stories on it. Yahoo Sports has a great timeline yep. of going through it. And the confusion of the timeline of all of this. If you told me simply that Ipe Mizuhara, this interpreter and good friend of, of Shohei Otani going back to 2013, was in trouble with a bookie, and needed money, and went to his friend and someone that you know he works for in Otani and requested the money that he has easily, and he helped him out with that money to get his buddy out of a jam, I, I wouldn't think anything of it. I'd think, man, you know, Otani's just a really nice, gentle soul, good guy, sure. helped his buddy out of it. And that's what it was leading to with statements from a lot of different people on a lot of different sides. And then... He says that he it's it's theft that he stole from him and that his legal team is involved and he stole. Is this an issue of honor and dishonoring yourself if you're Shohei Otani and you're helping out someone that's in trouble with an illegal bookmaker? Or is it something much darker than that? And we can go down the rabbit hole with that all we want. Is it something more with Otani's involvement? Is there a, a, some sort of fixing going on here? Did he know more about it? Was Otani gambling with the illegal bookmaker as well? We don't know that, and in fact, everyone is saying that's not true, including the guy being investigated, the illegal bookmaker. So we'll pump the brakes on that for a second. But isn't this story much more cut and dry and easily explainable, if not for the accusation of theft to the interpreter? Well, I think it's it, they don't want any money exchanged or transferred between Otani and this and this guy, the interpreter, Mizahara. Yeah. Because, Chad, what if he did bet on baseball? That's, that's the only key in all of this, is if he covered the debt of games and wagers placed, albeit he's $4.5 million of debt, to me it doesn't matter. If he, it, it, it got, guys cover debt all the time. Professional athletes, they have all these different requests from family members, friends, everybody's reaching out, right? In this case... It's just the fact that baseball and gambling can be involved. Otherwise, I think this is a routine deal where you're covering a friend, you're covering a, a coworker who's down in luck, right? They're, they're four and a half million in, and here I'm, I'm going to give you this to cover your debt, and we're going to move I forward. Because I have Because you have yeah. an issue, and we're going to make sure you get help, and we're going to have the clean slate. But the guy also changed his story, too, um, with ESPN. He, this was he claimed. This was yesterday, claiming that Otani quote had no knowledge of his gambling debts, and that Otani had not transferred money to the bookmakers' associate. That's the key, is that the money exchanged is with the bookmaker, right, the associate, and it's it's something where you at if that if you're doing that illegal the the illegal transfer based on the the bookie. That's a, a year suspension based on the Major League Baseball policy. Again, it's all... And who knows what this guy bet on? Well, and look, if there's a smoking gun, there's a smoking gun, and a federal investigation will get to the bottom of it. There's text. Isn't it interesting, though? So there's anything though, that... about knowledge than anything? But it is in everyone's best interest on the baseball side. MLB, Otani, and probably even Mizuhara, who's probably likely going to end up going to jail at some point for all this or, or do something, that he stays silent on this. Because they want, if there's anything else with this, it only serves them well to cover it up and make it simply a case of rich friend helping not so rich friend out of a jam. And that's it. But, isn't but the it... theft part of this makes it so weird. Yes. And now that it's like they've bought his silence, well, they where have... he's changed his story too. I'm talking about Ms. Hart. Right, okay. But they have to say that it was theft because they've connected the money back in some way. They've traced this back, and now he's lawyered up to say it was theft. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why the story got out. And, I mean, it, the Dodgers immediately fired the guy based on the accusation. So they, the, the paper trail's there to me based on how the reaction has unfolded. It's a great timeline to follow. And, again, it will continue. Yeah. 
you know? Well, this is a story that's got tentacles. We're going to be studying yes. this and looking at this and watching it and reading up on different things that happen throughout it, because there are so many different ways this can go. And the worst possible thing that yes. could happen for the sport, for everyone involved, is that there's any type of implication of impropriety from the sport's biggest star in Otani in any of this. Again, if this was just simply no theft charges were filed, the law firm didn't speak out, and, oh, Otani helped bail out a degenerate gambler buddy that was in, in debt to a bookie, an illegal bookie, mm -hmm. I don't think anything of it. I think everyone probably looks up and says, man, Otani's a good guy, I, 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 a nice guy to help out his friend. And now, because of the separate timeline of what was said, what was told to media, followed by, oh, never mind, none of that happened. He stole from us. Right. That's where I start to get suspicious. That's where the antennas go up with everyone. They say, is there something bigger happening here? And I, I don't know, but we're going to be asking those and questions. As I understand it, he has a separate interpreter than the Dodgers uh, employee who is, is the interpreter now. He was also an interpreter for other players in the clubhouse. Yeah. So that, that's also key because now he has the interpreter that the other players have within the clubhouse. Chad, any big updates on the tournament as we get into uh, Long Beach State discussion? Uh, South Carolina, Oregon tied. North Carolina, they're going to win. They're up 20 with about five and a half left. Arizona advances, got an, an early scare okay. from Long Beach State, but they're going to advance into the second round. Illinois up one on Moorhead State, so game to watch there in the second half of a possible big upset. But that's, that's what's happening right now in the NCAA tournament. Dan Monson, uh, the speaking of Long Beach State, yeah, and Dan I, Monson. yeah, I want to discuss like because I'm, I'm going to know what happens now uh, post game because he was fired. I think mutual parting of ways. What does How, he say next? What does he say next? And what is, what does Long Beach State say next? You know, as as an athletic program that let him go at least 17 seasons, he's been the head coach there, and uh, they went on a a losing streak, and he was fired before, but then agreed, and and the the program also agreed. Yeah, you can coach in the tournament. They went on to win the Big West, and they make the NCAA tournament. Here's Dan Monson prior to today's game against Arizona in the tournament. Yeah, I don't have to answer anything I don't want to because I'm working for free today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a you guys see the Seinfeld when he when when George Costanza was trying to get fired and couldn't get lose his job and still going to work every day and that's that's me. Is it an opening statement? Was that it? What do we got going? Yeah, well, I think you nailed it, Coach. We'll go ahead and uh, start with questions right here, please. And you're watching film, and you got hear guys sniffling and everything. And so the first, the first thing I said is, you know, just bonding together in this galvanizing is not going to be enough. Our defense has got to get better. We've got to be a better basketball team this week. And I said, just look at this first defensive clip, guys. I said, you know, we, we close out short here. I said, the guy's wide open. We don't get a contest. These are the kind of plays that would get a coach fired. And the whole room just broke up. And it just started right then. It was like, okay, you know, we're going to be all right here. Love that dude. Awesome. Love that dude. Hilarious. Keep that guy. But Dan, uh, Bobby Smitherin, who is the athletic director at Long Beach State, did you hear what he said? No. I take it he didn't have Long a Beach, sense of humor about This is about, about a few hours before tip-off against Arizona today. The timing of his decision, this is through um, this is through a paper in Salt Lake, and I'll give him credit in a moment um, because my I can't see the Is uh, the website. Salt Lake I, I, Tribune? I, we'll see in just a moment. So the timing of his decision to part ways with Dan Monson was done with the hope it might trigger the exact run oh that led gosh. the team on an unexpected trip to March Madness. That's the lead. Here's his quote. My belief and hope is that by doing what I did and the timing of it, they would play inspired. And that's what they did. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but it worked. <laughs> what? It, 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 you look foolish. Now, it doesn't look great for the now, team it is, that it plays is better. Like one of the, uh, usually it's an unintended consequence we always talk about. Well, maybe the team rallies now. Hey, ask Jake Diebler, who's now the head coach at Ohio State. They, they fire... Uh, Chris Holtzman, then they go with him, and suddenly, you know, they have a good finish, and he ends up getting the permanent job. But when you fire the coach 
but allow the coach to stay, and that fires up the team, that does lead me to believe when you make that statement as the AD that you actually want to keep the guy on as head coach. But That you've reversed your decision. But it's it, normally you play hard for the interim coach that you want to get the job, you know? You're keeping the same coach that you act like, I'm going to spark my team by getting rid of the coach. I'm going to fire the coach that they like. He was also hilarious. He said more than that in that press conference. He knows Tommy Lloyd pretty well, but he guaranteed victory against Arizona, which they did not do today. And he said, I want you to tell Tommy I said that. He also said, "Uh, here's what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to run the Princeton offense throughout because I know that works against them. Talking about them getting upset by Princeton <laughs> the year before, he said, "I That's know great. that works, so we're gonna we're gonna run the Princeton offense the entire game." Dude is hilarious. Uh, Adam, keep tabs on what he's gonna say post game. He's yeah. got to look. He's already got a tight five minute stand up set if he doesn't get back into coaching. But I'm looking to hire that guy as an assistant coach somewhere on my staff. Uh, after hearing all this, a great sense of humor and. Maybe he keeps his job, Hutton. Maybe they reinstate him Maybe. Uh, as head coach. Unless he's also... Uh, I think he's done with them. Yeah, and he's just a mutual parting of ways. Right. right? Give me, give me a my A change bio. in leadership is needed. Doesn't look like it, by the way. Doesn't look like it. Uh, how about the leadership of the ACC? Uh, counter-suing Clemson, just like they did with Florida State. And Chad, you've got to love this and how they opened up their complaint um, to uh, Clemson, who's the defendant in this counter. And they did, by, they did this by quoting the Clemson University president about the grant of rights that was signed and that was agreed to voluntarily by the university. And this was the quote then uh, for the, this is from June 21st, 2016. This is the first thing written. The ACC is a great conference and this increases the national exposure, brings in additional revenue and offers greater opportunity for student athletes. For us, and the Florida States and others, it stabilizes the conference long term. James Clements, Clemson University president, and then chair of the ACC's Council of Presidents. I just don't know how what the argument is here. I've been consistent with this throughout. You signed it. You said all these nice things about it then. You loved it when it happened. And now everything else around you has changed. Right. So now I'm going to sue and say what you're doing is unlawful and unheard of. And I, I just I don't I don't see how they have a case against the ACC. And quite frankly, if I'm the ACC, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm counter suing both of them. And not, you knew this lawsuit was going to come. And don't take less like the Big Twelve did. And I love how they're also saying if you're going to file it, file it in Charlotte, where our headquarters are, yeah. in Mecklenburg County. Yeah. Stop going around us in local courts. And another theory is they did this so they can show a timestamp on notice that they want to leave. Right. You know. And then they end up paying if they want to pay to, to break the grant of rights and to join whatever is about to happen.